All right, so this is 141. By the way, tomorrow is the job fair at 630. So go to that if you're looking for a, um, a job. Just go here, there's a Zoom link for it. And I have a class tomorrow at 6, but if a lot of students want to go to the job fair, I'll knock it off early so they can leave the job and go do this without missing anything. Um, if you're in that class tomorrow, we'll talk about it between 6 and 6.30, and I'll, I'll let you know what's going on. But anyway, go to this thing if you're looking for a job. And uh, we're here in 141, and today it's randomness. So we're down here. Um, all right. So let's talk about randomness. Should be open in one of my other windows. And here it is. All right. There, that should about do it. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about what randomness is. That's true. And even if you're looking for a better job, you might want to go there just to hear what's on offer. And we'll talk about entropy, the mathematical measure of randomness, and uh, the various kinds of random number generators and the problems they can have. Good? All right. So here's Dilbert, you know, a random number generator that says 999999. And are you sure it's random? And that's the problem. You can't be sure. How do you know whether that's random or not? That could happen by random. Uh, so, for example, is this series of numbers more random than that series of numbers? Now, most people would say this is more random. And that's because, if you think about it, this exact pattern, 1101101110, is not any more or less likely than all zeros. But when you just glance at this number, you don't really memorize the pattern. You describe it in vague terms like three zeros and five ones. And if you look at it in that term, the number of combinations that have three zeros and five ones is a large number, much larger than this. So this is much more likely in that respect than all zeros to appear. And so this is uh, where you, you have to be careful to carefully define what you mean when you want to mesh questions about math in general and randomness. Um, all right, so a probability distribution is uh, the likelihood of various outcomes happening. So if you have a fair coin and you flip it, it has a 50% chance of heads and a 50% chance of tails. And a fair die has a one-sixth chance of one and one-sixth of everything up to the six. So the total is always 100%, and a uniform distribution means each of the outcomes is equally likely. And those are the things you use in games of chance like gambling games. Um, all right. And this Shannon, Claude Shannon, a mathematician, figured out how to do this with math. So if your distribution has probabilities, probability of 1, probability of 2, up to probability of n for n outcomes, and these have to add up to 1, there, it's of something that has n possible results, <clears throat> then the entropy is this, minus p1 times log p1, minus p2 times log p2, and so on, where log is to the base 2. <clears throat> That's the mathematical analysis. And so, one random bit, like the fair coin, has a one-half chance of being a one and a one-half chance of being zero. So the entropy is minus one-half log one-half, minus one-half log one-half. Now the log to the base two of one-half is minus one, because this is two to the minus one, and the log means you take the exponent. So if you have two to the minus one, the log of that is minus one. So this is minus one times minus a half, which is a half, and this is the same thing, so you get a total of 1. And that's what Claude Shannon noticed. If you have one thing that could be either a 0 or a 1, that is what we call 1 bit, and you would therefore like to say the amount of information it contains is 1 bit, and you do this math, you get an entropy of 1, so that's the information content. One bit that could be a 0 or could be 1 has got one bit of information in it. So, if you use a byte that has 8 bits, then there are 256 possible values from 0 to 255, and each one of them is equally likely. So each one of them has 1 over 256 chance of happening. So the entropy is minus 1 over 256 times the log of 1 over 256, and there's 256 equal terms there. Now this is 2 to the minus 8, so the log is minus 8. So it's minus 8 times minus 1 over 256, which is 1 over 1 eighth of 256, which is 132, 32nd, I think. So you have 256 terms, and at each 132nd, you get a total of 8 bits. So again, it's quite logical. If you have 8 bits in a byte, and they're all equally likely, then you have 8 bits of data. 
So this is 8 bits of information content, and that's how we defined Shannon information content, and we've talked about it before. So if you have bits, if you have bytes that are not very random, like they're ASCII text, so they really don't explore your values, then you know from experience, if you have a, a file full of ASCII text, you can run it through WinZip and zip it and make it smaller because there's wasted, uh, there's not really 8 bits of information stored in there. There's basically wasted space like air you can squeeze out of it. But if you have random bits, then you can't compress it. If you compress it, it doesn't get smaller because it's already at maximum compression. And that's what happens. Random bits are contain the maximum amount of information, which is 8 bits per byte. <clears throat> so one non-random bit. If you have a 100% chance of 0 and a 0% chance of 1, then this log of 1 is 0. Log of 0 is minus infinity, but it turns out as you approach 0, it grows much more slowly than this goes to 0, so the combination here is fairly regarded as 0. So you get 0 bits, which is what you'd figure. If there's no variation in the bit, if they're always 0, then they contain no information. They don't actually store any information. It's always just the same fixed value. So we can do this with Python. Let me bring up my Python code, which is here. OK. So it's clear. All right. So if we do um, enter P1, all right, let's find out what's going on here. Control C, LS. All right. And t dot. All right. So this one has probability of 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So this is the fair coin. We print out the probabilities, and then I just do this calculation. Uh, for every probability in the list, I take the probability times the log of the probability to the base 2. So if we do Python 3int.py, we get entropy of 1. Which is what I said, one bit that has an equal chance of being 1 or 0 has an information content of one bit. So let's take a look at the next one. Cat. Oh, I can't type. All right, int 2. There we go. So this is the three bits. There are eight possible values, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, each one of them equal to 1 eighth. And you go through the same calculation. So if you do Python 3 int two, you get an entropy of three. This is three bits of information. You have eight possibilities, just like you would with three bits. All right. And int three, let's do int three here. This is the uneven coin, 90% chance of zero, 10% chance of one. So if you run that one, you get entropy of half a bit because it has less information than a random bit, but it has more than zero information because there's some chance of it varying, so that's half a bit of entropy. And I made another one here where we can just play with various possibilities. Um, and 4 just lets us change it to anything we want. So if I make the probability of heads 0.5, the entropy is 1. And if I make it 0.9, the entropy is 0 0.5, 0 0.46 over there. And if I make it 0 0.99, it's 0 0.08. If I make it 0 0.99999, it's 0, 0, 0, 0. So this is what I mean. If, if you make it almost 100%, you get very close to 0. And of course, if I do put in a probability of 1, then it's going to crash because it can't take the log of 0. Um, but anyway, you can get very close to that, and you'll see that it is approaching 0. All right. So that's those Python possibilities. And let's take a look at some cahoots, which is this one here, 2a. Looks pretty good.
people still coming in i see twisted says he's going to shave the beard and braid the hair for tomorrow uh that's something steve nelson said he said it we used to have a job fair face to face he said the students that showed up in good clothes got jobs better show up so he says it matters you got to look professional all right let's see what happens here <clears throat> All right, so what's log of 1 over 4 to the base 2? quarter is 2 to the minus 2. So the log is minus 2. All right. All right. What's the entropy of a random bit? would seem pretty obvious one bit has an information content of one bit all right all right what's the entropy of a random byte bits of course 8 bits as long as they have an equal chance of every possible value have entropy of 8 bits all right and what's the entropy of a single random base 64 character That's six bits. Base 64 has 64 possible values instead of 256, so that is 2 to the 6. six uh, 64 possible values means it takes six bits to encode that. That contains six bits of information. If you have all possible 256 values, then you have eight bits. But with base 64, you only have six bits of information in each byte. All right. My grader has asked me to remind people if you use fake names and you don't tell me who you are, you won't get your points. But a lot of people are doing that, and she wonders if those people really all don't care. So, anyway, I see one of these Rohit. I know that's a real name. The other people are not getting their points unless they come out of the closet. Anyway, it's three points every time. Perhaps you don't care about that small amount, but anyway... Uh, I'm reminding you as she asked me to. So let's talk about random number generators. Oh, I see a private message has popped up. Perhaps someone has come out of the closet. Aha! They have. Good. So one of these people has identified themselves. Good. I've got that. I know who good word is. Good. Good. All right. Good. Private messages seem to work in the, uh, uh-oh. There we go. They could be auditing. Yes, of course. People could just be wandering in watching the class, which is fine. All right. So anyway, we got random number generators and pseudo-random number generators. Now, a random number generator is a real source of entropy that somehow gets some kind of real random input from something, like... Uh, electrical noise in a circuit or human mouse movements or something 
and the pseudo random number generator mm -hmm. is something that uses something like a hash function to calculate a bunch of bits that look random, but they really have been calculated on an algorithm. So that's random number generators coming from the environment, things like temperature, acoustic noise, mm -hmm. key presses, mouse movements, you know, real sources of unpredictable external data. There are quantum random noise generators that work on quantum movements, like radioactive decay or photons or vacuum polarization, which is photons that pop out of nothingness. There are, and in a way, a random electrical noise is also basically quantum mechanical in nature. That's just one of the uh, natural processes that can create random bits. A pseudo-random noise generator creates many artificial bits from a few truly random bits, and it'll keep working even if the physical source stops. So you have some random data coming in from the external world into your random number generator that produces some random bits. You feed them into a pseudo-random number generator that does something like calculate a hash function from it to create a pseudo-random series of bits. Um, all right. So what it does is at regular intervals, it fetches more random bits from random number generator, it updates its entropy pool, and then it just mixes those pools bits together with something like a hash function and just create a stream of bits. And the idea is the stuff you get from the real world might not be perfectly random. It might not be equally zeros and ones. So you use some kind of function to scramble it again so that the output of that really will be even. All right. And so that's a deterministic random bit generator. You feed in the random bits from the real random number generator, and that is the seed, and then you run it through a deterministic calculation. So if you get exactly the same bits again from the random number generator, you'll get the same output bits, because it is something simple like a hash function. Um, all right. So you've got various operations. You can initialize it, which will load the entropy pool in the internal state. You can update it called reseeding, where you pick up not from starting from zero, but you add new randomness and you mix that with the existing values to move forward. And then you've got next that returns n random bits and updates the entropy pool. These are operations you do with the pseudo random number generator. So uh, there are different mathematical properties that a random number generator could have. Forward secrecy means that you um, cannot take the current values and guess what values came out in the past. There's no pattern there. That's forward secrecy. This is a really important issue. Um, prediction resistance is the opposite, where you can't take some values and then predict what's coming next. You would like both of these properties. You would like, say, if I read a thousand bits out of the random number generator, I would like it to be the knowledge of those thousand bits do not enable me to predict what's coming next or to predict what came before. Now, until very recently, TLS did not have forward secrecy. Until I think TLS 1.2, um, the HTTPS connections would keep reusing the same private key for many transmissions. And that is why the National uh, NSA in America has built this gigantic data center in Utah, storing incredible amounts of data. They are being archiving all the data on the internet at this monstrous facility in Utah for years because TLS did not have forward secrecy. And that means they can record all that encrypted traffic, and then if years later they manage to hack into one of the computers and steal the private key, they can retroactively go back and decrypt all that traffic. So somewhere in all that traffic is all the child porn and all the terrorism and all the kidnapping and every other crime you might care about in all that encrypted traffic. And because of the lack of forward secrecy, they can gradually decrypt it as long as they can store it all and process it all and then hunt through it for all that badness. So it's been a gigantic project going on for quite a while. And uh, now we're using TLS 1.2 and 1.3 that has forward secrecy and therefore the value of that gigantic archive should be less for time periods within the last few years when we all started using TLS 1.2 and 1.3, unless TLS 1.2 and 1.3 are defective or poisoned and in fact are more predictable than we think, which is possible and which has happened many times in the past. So if you want to achieve resistance, you want a refresh and next operation to be irreversible. So if you obtain the entropy pool, you cannot reverse the operation and go back and calculate the previous bits. 
and you have to refresh reg regularly with fresh randomness so that the future becomes hard to predict. So Fortuna is one designed by Ferguson and Schneier, and that's what Windows used. Um, and it uses 32 entropy pools and a 16-byte key and a 16-byte counter. Mac OS and iOS also use something defined partly by Bruce Schneier. He's a very famous uh, um, cryptographer, and he invented both of these, and they use their version. Are there any metrics to indicate how much better TLS 1.2 is than 1.0? Um, I don't know if there are metrics, but there certainly are a lot of comparisons. TLS 1.2 is considered to be much better. Um, it is using all, and you'll see as we go through this book, we'll talk, a whole chapter is coming up in it, but the point is cryptography is a rapidly evolving uh, engineering discipline. Every year or two, they decide that things are not really good about the current algorithms and make better ones. So TLS 1.2 is much better than 1.0, and 1.3 is better again. One big thing is it has perfect forward secrecy because it adds an extra random key to every transmission. So you cannot predict one, you can't use the key from one transmission for a different transmission. And it also uses the very latest version of all the cryptographic algorithms with the latest recommended key sizes. So we'll, we'll go through it in great detail in a few chapters, but um, each, each version of TLS is much stronger than the one before it although they're all pretty good. But the big change is perfect forward secrecy. Now, if nobody hacks in your server and steals your private key, they're all perfectly fine, I think, for most people. But, you know, if, if you're going to consider, like, enemy military and the whole NSA trying to find your stuff, then they're not really all the same, because then you have a really powerful adversary willing to really expend a lot of money to get in, and then the later one is much better. So it's all a matter of threat modeling, you know. If you're buying a pair of shoes on Amazon, TLS 1.0 is probably good enough. But if you're plotting to start a war, then you probably really ought to be using TLS 1.3 instead of 1.2. Anyway, so if the random number generators don't have enough random bits, Fortuna might not notice and just keep creating pseudo-random bits to be lower quality because it'll refresh the pool, but there won't really be enough new random bits to really thoroughly randomize the pool. Um, if you can get the seed files and reuse them, if you can somehow steal the input, then you'd be able to predict all the outputs. Um, all right, so a lot of programming languages like PHP, Python, Ruby, use the Mersen Twister, which is a non-cryptographic pseudo-random number generator. And if you take it, any programming classes, you've probably seen this happen. They'll say, here's the common random number generator, but you should be aware this isn't a really very good one. They're not cryptographically secure. They are predictable. Cryptographic random number generators are unpredictable, but the average one you get easily built into programming languages is typically quite predictable. But it's really only intended, I think, for use in games and such. Anyway, so here's some real world ones. In Unix, you have dev u random, which gets data from the crypto pseudo random number generator, and therefore it always returns data, even if entropy is low. Dev random is the blocking one, which refuses to return data if there's not enough entropy. This can make quite a... Uh, blocking was an idea that your random number generator would stop pumping out bits if there wasn't enough randomness for them to be really, really random. And therefore, you would know, and you'd have to like make the user wait longer for randomness to build up or something. But it turned out that this was a weakness. You could create a denial of service condition by fooling your operating system about the number of random bits. And uh, so in practice, they said it's better to just not be blocking and cut out random bits, even if they're not as random as they should be. Uh, things went back and forth this way. This is something I noticed a long time ago when I installed some kind of security training product that ran on Tomcat. And I just took a, a Ubuntu server and I put on a default Tomcat install. And then I put on this product and it would take 45 minutes to boot up. And this was a known problem because it would be trying to get enough randomness to seed the random numbers to make the key for the encryption for Tomcat, and there wasn't enough randomness in Ubuntu. So it would just wait 45 minutes to get the randomness. And you can install this special, special thing called Havjed, and Havjed will create enough randomness. So all you had to do is install this, and now it'll boot up in like five seconds. It was amazing. And you can see it now. So I've got that set to go here. I've got a Debian machine here. And so here is the um, 
What I do on the top one is I watch the randomness. In fact, I'll just put it on the side. So what this does is for up to 100, it's going to just read the entropy available from this system location and update it every two seconds. So the entropy available is 322, which is surprisingly low. Thought it would be more by now, but anyway, it'll probably do for this demonstration. And now the other one is here. Okay, this one I'm going to consume some entropy. So I'm going to put this down there where it won't get in the way. All right, and to consume entropy, I'm just going to do this. I take uh, the input file from dev random and I read a bunch and put it out in base 64. So there I used up some entropy. Run, stop messing with me. Uh, okay, it ran out of entry, went down to 50 here. Okay, so uh, because I demonstrated it before class, it's gotten so low on entropy, it can't even do one of these without failing. You see the entropy fell down to just 50 available bits. So let's fix this by adding havget. All you have to do is sudo apt install havget. All right, and now that I've done that, now suddenly there's 2300 bits of entropy. And now, even if I try using them up, there is some, and there's some. You see, I'm using about 500 each time. Now it's down to 1,000. Now it's back up to 2,000. I used up 500. When I try to use another 500, it goes back up. So, you know, it Havjed gives it plenty of entropy. So it can keep up with my consuming entropy here pretty well. Whereas without Havjed, if I get rid of Havged with purge, and I, of course, have no idea how to pronounce Havged, probably some foreign language or something. Anyway, uh, now it's up to 1,400. Now one of these takes it down by 500, and there it's down by another 500, and there it's down to no entropy at all. So now it can't even create one block of base 64 anymore it cannot read enough to make one. And see, entropy is down to zero. I don't know how Havged works. I haven't looked into it in detail. Um, but there are online pages explaining it. It somehow uh, creates some degree of entropy. I would imagine it's not really high quality entropy because it doesn't have any access to external data. I think it probably creates pseudo random stuff. Here, it creates an easy to use, unpredictable random number generator based on an adaptation of the HavGE algorithm. So. Anyway, uh, it's a good question, and I didn't look into it, but you can. All right, so Windows uses uh, crypt gen random now created, now replaced by bcrypt gen random, and this takes entropy from a kernel mode driver, and uh, it's like Fortuna, but it's improved, presumably. And uh, in, uh, in order to deal with all this, Intel in 2012 with Ivy Bridge put a hardware random number generator in the processor, which is really not that hard to do. All you have to have is a resistor with current going through it, and then you magnify the noise of that current going through. So they said, there, now we're going to have a high quality source of high quality random numbers, but people refuse to use it. A lot of people refuse to use it because you can't audit it. You can't test it. And the problem is there could be a backdoor in it. And the problem here, this has happened many times. In 2007, Microsoft researchers found that the National Institute of Standards uh, elliptic curve cryptography pseudo-random number generator might have had a backdoor in it. And when I saw um, Bruce Schneier and others give a talk about this at a privacy convention, he said, if you wanted to have the NSA's ultimate goal, which is no bus, you want to have a backdoor in cryptography that nobody can use but us, poisoning the random number generator is probably the best way to do it. Because you'll have a secret number that nobody else knows that lets you predict the random numbers and nobody else can figure out. They can't prove that you've done it and they can't get it as long as you don't let someone steal that secret. So these guys aren't saying the NSA just intentionally put a backdoor, but what they are saying is that the, in principle, if you could solve a particular instance of the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem, you'd be able to predict these random numbers. And the person who designed the algorithm, which is NSA, might have solved that problem, and they might have given us an algorithm where they can predict the numbers. And we would have no way of knowing that. And Schneier checked 
And he found that this algorithm that was being pushed by the National Institute of Standards under pressure from the NSA was in fact 1,000 times slower than other choices for no good reason. And therefore he said avoid it. This really looks suspicious. It really looks like the NSA has poisoned it and they're pressuring us into using it because they can predict the numbers. You haven't proven that, but it looks fishy. And then of course came out Snowden. Snowden leaked out documents showing that the NSA was attacking American companies as if they were adversaries in order to crack into their encryption and their systems. And they showed how much money was being spent per year. Um, these, I think, are millions of dollars per year being spent on various uh, millions of dollars, $300 million being spent in 2011 and more in 2012 and 2013 being spent to poison civilian cryptography so people would use insecure cryptography. That's the civilian positions and, and civilian FTE. And they explain here what this is. The SIGINT enabling project actively engages the U.S. and foreign industries to covertly influence and overtly leverage their commercial products design. They make the system exploitable. So the NSA was busted because of Snowden leaking this out as explicitly poisoning cryptography used in civilian products so it would be weak enough for the NSA to hack into, which had long been suspected. Uh, would a random noise source like a conductor be limited by the instrument capturing? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, of course. Uh, and that's the problem, of course, with hardware sources of entropy. They're subject to all the defects of hardware. They might, for example, one thing you might imagine is you could control the output of a electronic random number generator by feeding in something like microwave radiation. So it's, you might be able to detect what the random numbers are by picking up radio signals emitted by the current. You know, that's, that's the thing. Once you go to hardware, there are side channel attacks. So absolutely. That's why you run it through hashing after that, to try to compensate for the defects of the uh, physical device, which is, of course, not perfectly random. But absolutely, you're on the right track there. And so here's what they did. Resources in the project are used to insert vulnerabilities in encryption systems, influence policies and standards. And so the National Institute of Standards was caught several times proposing and pushing broken encryption routines like um, DES that they knew were not safe because the NSA told them this is the one we should use. And the reason the NSA wanted us to use it is not because it was the best to protect us, but because they could break in. Because their mission is not to protect us from criminals, their mission is to read everything to try to find the crime. So anyway, so NIST abandoned this one eventually. In, by 2015, they finally decided to cut it out of the standard because of all this bad press. Uh, it was never officially proven or admitted that the NSA had poisoned it, but the rumor became so large that nobody wanted to use it. And uh, there were a lot of other scandals involving uh, the NSA paying RSA, a million dollars to make it one of their standards and all that jazz. A lot of fishy things happened. That's why the cryptographers in general tend to be very, very, very rebellious and angry at the government. They see the government as pretty much the enemy of good cryptography because so many times they have done this. Anyway, um, and now, of course, the king of that was Apple. Apple pushed that they were going to be a high privacy solution. They were never going to let the government in. They went to the point of locking the government out of a dead terrorist's iPhone, saying we're protecting privacy of a dead terrorist by not letting the FBI see what's on that phone, which is a really extreme position to take. And yet, a couple weeks ago, they said, oh, we'll just let the government scan everybody's phone to find the child porn on it. And people are sort of floored by this and trying to figure out what happened here because Apple went from being the champion of privacy to just rolling over. <laughs> and uh, it does make us think something something's going on behind the scenes. Anyway, um, so Netscape, their SSL in 1996 used the process ID and the system time in microseconds as the random number. And that sounds good, but of course it's not that good because the system time is, I think, just counting how many microseconds since you turned on the device. So that's not all that random. Anyway, it had 47 bits of randomness in practice. Um, this is one that got a lot of press back in 2012. Researchers tested all the HTTPS keys that were out there all the public certificates to see if they shared prime numbers. And a lot of them did, like one in a thousand. So 7 million of them, uh, 27,000 out of 7 million had a shared prime factor. 
And people wondered, how could this be? Because if you really chose random numbers randomly that were like 100 digits long, it would never happen. The two of them had shared prime factors. And after many speculative guesses, they finally settled that the problem was that they were just generated by identical hardware at an identical time. And so you'd boot up a device like a router that would try to generate a random key to do something like a, a VPN connection, and it would take so many seconds to boot up, then it would seed the random number generator with something like the clock, then it would generate some random primes, and it had a pretty high chance of another router booting up be happening to hit this line at exactly the same microsecond and generating the same prime number. That was the idea. Um, that was the explanation of this. All right, and uh, here's the Mercy, Mercy N Twister was used in Wikipedia to generate random things. I'm not quite sure what Wikipedia needs random things for, but whatever they were using, it wasn't very good. And uh, CryptoCat was a, she, in the Arab Spring, which was what, 2011, 2012, something like that, when a whole bunch of Arab countries had a popular uprising where people would protest and the governments would respond with brutal violence and stuff. So they had to plan these protests and they were mostly just using unencrypted Twitter to do that. They were on Twitter posting, we're at this block, we're running to this block, we're running away, go back home because the cops are coming out, things like that. And they were posting it from real Twitter accounts, often tied to their real names, so the cops could find them and round them up. So there became a great interest in providing these activists with some encrypted chat service that they could use instead of Twitter, which was not encrypted at all at that time. And so they invented this thing called CryptoCat, was invented by a sort of activist who said, this is your encrypted chat. And he had a bunch of um, mathematical flaws in his early version because he wasn't a very good cryptographer. But this became very popular because it was easy to use. And so a lot of people got mad at CryptoCat for not being cryptographically secure enough, but he updated it. And anyway, here's some of the mistakes he made, not off by one error. So he had less entropy than they should have. Um, but his argument, which is probably true, is it was better than using Twitter with no encryption at all. <laughs> and that all the things that were better at that time were so hard to use that your average political activist could not figure out how to use them. <laughs> or your average journalist, which was also true. Anyway, let's take a look at another Kahoot. We're done with 2A and we're up to 2B. Guess that's it. All right, so which one of these harvests entropy from the keyboard and mouse? That's a random number generator. Reads a real, supposedly random input from some physical input. All right, which one of these updates the pool?
All right, that's the pseudo random number generator. All right. Uses this has these various methods, one of which is to update the pool. All right, so what does the Mac use? Yarrow, okay. And what's the source of random bits that's recommended for Linux? U-random is recommended because it is non-blocking. It will always give you enough bits, even if they're not perfect. Random will refuse to produce any bits if there's not enough randomness, and that turns out to be a bad idea. All right. All right, that's Hema. I think that's a real name or close enough to it. Woot is totally not. <laughs> and that one, I know who that person is. All right, good. All right. Let me stop this.